Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Fantasy Fangirls Podcast, where two sisters dive deep into beloved fantasy lore, characters, themes, theories, and more. Thank you for joining us today as we do a Fantasy Fangirls Q&A bonus episode. This is a highly requested episode from our listeners, and it is dedicated to getting to know Nicole and I a little bit better. This is also our second AMA episode that we have done, so please be sure to check out our first one from September, which feels like yesterday, to learn (laughs) even more about us. As always, let's kick it off with our content warnings, which is going to look a little bit different for today's episode. First of all, this bonus episode is spoiler free. Wow. I think that's the first time we've ever said that on this podcast. (laughs) Since today's topic is focused on getting to know Lexi and I better, it is safe to listen to if you haven't read A Court of Thorns and Roses or Iron Flame or whatever other books. We're not talking about a lot of book plots today. Next up, this podcast is rated R like always. We of Fantasy Fangirls are adults who say adult things with adult words. Well, usually about adult books, but not today, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Odds are this ain't your first rodeo with fantasy fangirls, so you know that I drop F-bombs regularly, at least enough to horrify some of our family members. So please be mindful of little listening ears. Last thing before we jump into today's Q&A discussion. If you love fantasy fangirls and you want to support us in making this dream our livelihood, if you want more content, more community connection, discounts on merch, remember we just launched that new logo and our old logo is going bye-bye on the 19th, which is next week. Early access to ad-free episodes and more, then all of that can be found within our Patreon. We have two membership tiers, Cadets and Dragon Riders. In fact, all of today's questions are from Patreon members. Even though we're still unfortunately not able to get to every question, we will make sure that we answer all of them as a comment reply from the Patreon or Discord post for submitting questions. So Patreon members, if you didn't hear your question here today, don't worry, we will still answer it. The link to join our Patreon is in the show notes or the YouTube caption. And really and truly, thank you to everyone who is in our Patreon for helping helping us bring these episodes to you. And now, Lexi, it is time to get to know the fantasy fangirls. That's us. <laughs> Let's kick off this Q&A with questions around the podcast. We got a lot about the podcast and what's next, so let's hit the ground running. Well, let's start off with that exact question. A lot of people asked, What's next for fantasy fangirls? So we'll divide this into two categories because the answer is a lot. There is a lot that is coming up next for the podcast, for our community, for us. So number one, what is next for our signature deep dive episodes? We'll wrap up our Iron Flame book coverage on February 12th, and then we're going to do a bonus episode on Violet's second signet possibilities on February 19th to close out our Empyrean coverage, at least for now. Then we're wasting absolutely no time and jumping right into A Court of Thorns and Roses on Monday, February 26th. Mark your calendars, everyone. And yes, there will be spoilers for the whole ACOTAR series, books one through five, from the very first episode that we do. You know us, you know how we do our deep dives, but there will not be spoilers for the rest of the Mass Verse. So it's safe if you haven't read Throne of Glass or Crescent City. For instance, I have not started the Throne of Glass series, so don't worry, there are not going to be spoilers for either of those two series in our ACOTAR deep dive episodes. ACOTAR is going to be the better part of 2024 because it's five books and many of them, most of them are very dense. So we're going to finish Akatar in approximately November, but please don't hold that to us. We definitely intend to sprinkle in other fantasy content while we cover our Akatar to break it up a bit, but we don't know what that's going to look like yet. We barely know what January looks like, let alone <laughs> February and beyond. We don't know and we don't plan to commit anytime soon on what is going to follow Akatar. It will depend on Empyrean 3 and Akatar 6 when those books come out, which of of course, we're going to cover, or maybe another book will release this year and sweep us all off our feet like Fourth Wing did in 2023. We're purposefully leaving our options very open because there's too many unknowns right now, but we promise, we promise to let you all know our listeners, our amazing fan base, as soon as possible, as soon as we finalize what that schedule is going to look like, because we know that many of you are reading the books in preparation for the podcast, which means more to us than you will ever No. The second answer about what's next for the podcast, it's all about content outside of our deep dive coverage. So first up, we are launching our monthly newsletter very, very soon. It'll include schedules, announcements, roundups of lesser known fantasy books. We know you all have been craving to hear from other authors, and that is absolutely what this newsletter is going to bring you. It'll also have spotlights on small businesses, trivia questions, and so much more. And the link to subscribe is in our show notes slash YouTube caption. And we really are, we're working hard on getting that to you as soon as possible here in January. We will also continue 
doing bonus episodes here and there. For instance, in a few weeks, we'll have a bonus episode all about Harry Potter insights and theories with Andrew from MuggleCast. We're really excited about that. We were on MuggleCast in November, and now we're going to be bringing Andrew on. And we were originally thinking maybe we'd do some fourth wing content. But you know what? We've had so many people ask us for a Harry Potter specific content. So we are going to do a bonus episode dedicated to Harry Potter. We're so excited. We also plan to do a Crescent City 3 reactions bonus episode in February. I'm so excited. I just got chills up and down my whole body. I fucking cannot wait for that book. Oh my God. There's also been a lot of requests to bring our husbands on an episode. So that is also on the horizon. We are so excited. We will definitely bring them on sometime in the very near future. We will also have more bonus content on the Massverse, especially as we do start our Akatar deep dives, but we are going to keep it separate for spoiler reasons, obviously. And then lastly, on this very lengthy answer for what's next for the podcast, we have some big ass goals for this year and most of them we're not ready to show our hands quite yet on but a few things that we are intending on making happen number one is live shows and other opportunities to see you all in person we, this is something we re- get requested for a lot and please know that we are talking with some people to make this happen we're also planning on creating more content that branches out from our weekly deep dive episodes and across platforms this is exactly what Lexi just said all about that bonus content eventually also we hope to cover the tv series adaptations especially with Akatar and fourth wing and from blood and ash they're all of the above are on the far off horizon but know that we are definitely planning on covering those and excited to devour them as fans as well and then next question here question number two from brooke on discord in retrospect what is one thing we would do differently when starting the podcast this could be on the technical side something foundational or anything else i'm going to answer from the tech side since that's my 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 domain really i really wish I'm going to go ahead and say, I'm not really someone who regrets much of anything. I don't regret anything from the beginning. This is something where it's like, oh, if we had done that differently, that would have been nice. But like, am I like laying awake at night? Absolutely not over it. I do wish we had updated our equipment. It's just it truly for no other reason than it's easier on the ear. And it's also easier for me as I'm processing editing and all that kind of stuff. Specifically, Lexi's first mic. It was one of my old mics and I wanted to throw it in a lake burning like a hot potato. <laughs> that thing so much. I forced her to get a new one and it didn't take much convincing, thank God. But that's also something we're looking to do in the near future is updating some of our other tech just to make things easier and more pleasant for you all as listeners. But on the content side, however, Lexi, I don't know if I would have done anything different. I'll be straight up honest. I agree. Like I'm really grasping at straws here, but if there was anything I would have done differently on the content side, I would say maybe being a little bit more mindful of spoilers for other series, specifically yeah. Akatar, in our very early fourth wing episodes I think that you and I because we had just come from Akatar, we kind of had a bit of an assumption that most people were coming from Akatar. we've now since become very strict on absolutely no spoilers for other series except Harry Potter and usually Game of Thrones because those are just embedded in pop culture. Something we did do differently that actually really paid off was switching from Akatar to Fourth Wing. We intended to kick the podcast off with Akatar, and we even recorded several episodes of book one, but we made a last minute pivot to change it to Fourth Wing coverage instead because of the timing with Iron Flame's upcoming release. And I, like, I can't stress this enough. I think it was really and truly one of the best decisions we have ever made, not just in business or with the podcast, but just like in general, best decisions. <laughs> I remember specifically the day you texted me. We, I was like, I have about seven episodes of our ACOTAR coverage outlined. Like I was, for whatever reason, I was killing myself over getting these outlines really far ahead. That's something I would have done differently. I would have chilled the fuck out. But <laughs> I remember you texted me and you were like, Nicole, I can't leave Bezgayeth, I can't leave this world. Like, can we please switch to fourth wing? Can we open up this conversation? And I was like, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> like, yeah. no, please, no. But then you and I had a conversation over it and it just made more sense. Because originally we were like, what if we did Akatar and then switch to fourth wing and then did the Iron Flame episode? And we were like, that would kill us. We can't do that. We meant to do fourth wing in five episodes originally, which I just <laughs> is laughable now. But yes, we barely made it in eight, honestly. <laughs> But I can't I can't echo what you said more, Lex. Like it was one of the best decisions we ever made. Yes, from a business standpoint. Yes, from a I think one of the reasons this podcast did pop off as much as it did is because Fourth Wing was such a 
embedded in book talk and bookstagram conversation but also just like for us like I now am able to go to Akatar with such a different mindset than I yes. was like I mean those seven episodes yes they are outlined they're basically going to get scrapped and started over for me at least before you ask sweet listeners no those Akatar episodes will never see the light of day for two main reasons one my editing is horrible I like as a person who loves and prides herself in her work that she does even though I do make mistakes yes I will not let those episodes see the light of day just for my pride but secondly because we've just become different podcasters now you and I have found a rhythm that is so embedded in the show that we didn't have when we first started Akatar. however I do think that having two episodes under our belt even though they did get scrapped made starting fourth wing that much easier absolutely we kind of were able to shake off the initial you know, the first few episodes of any podcast are not going to be great. No. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what kind of production you have behind it. It is not going to be great because it, you're literally starting something fresh. And even our first few fourth wing episodes still, like we look back on it. It's like, oh my gosh, like I kind of cringe listening to I myself. can't listen to them. I will not. Like I can't to listen to them now. Yeah. And it's like, we've come such a long way already. And I'm so excited to see, you know, to be able to look back on even this period and be like, wow, like, you know, like eventually we're going to be cringing at what we're saying even right now. So I'm so excited for what the future is going to bring to and yeah so from patreon caitlin b asks how long does it take you to prepare for episodes each week what is the process lord have mercy caitlin (laughs) oh boy so for the episode deep dives step one is of course reading the section chapters while i usually do listen to audiobooks i absolutely have to read from an ebook for the deep dive reading i have no idea how nicole does her weird ass thing here but i tend to over highlight and i have a super minimal color code yellow for most everything it's like my cat all brown for foreshadowing and favorite moments and then red for archives my annotations are absolutely not legible like they're just like little like short words and they are specifically just designed to trigger my thought when I do review it later when I am going through the outline I'm gonna also put a caveat that this is after we have read the book first the first time as a fan then basically had the book on loop over and over and over again just so we can get every nuance as much as possible especially for the foreshadowing section because that's really important to us so for me I sit down with (laughs) this is my as Lexi puts it my weird ass annotating (laughs) way I sit down with my (laughs) ebook that's on my iPad my audiobook and my laptop and basically I listen through the entire it takes me multiple days but I listen through the chapter stretch that we're covering and as I'm listening I'm reading at the same time it's very important to me that I'm reading this portion I basically listen to audiobooks for everything else. But for this, I have to read because the, how else would I catch my fucking italics then? <laughs> like I have to. But for me, I pause the audiobook and my reading whenever something pops into my head or whenever I want to research a theory or whenever I want to check something. And I write for however long and then I go back to listening. It takes me far longer and I'm actually switching up my way of doing these a little bit now that I'm just kind of I have the audiobook again on repeat especially as we get to the end section I'm not as familiar with the end of Iron Flame and I really want to be as familiar as possible with it so as I'm listening through it I'm like catching different things and I pop open my ebook whether that's on my phone or my iPad and I highlight and write a quick note real quick and it does make the outlines much much faster so I'm still adjusting my way of doing these things but I will say my quote weird ass way still doing pretty well for me Lexi I'm I, it works for you I'm not faulting that I'm just like it is I'm just giving you a hard time <laughs> you can listen and read and do all of that at the same time like it is so different from what I do now I'm going to do a quick shout out to our mods because we were chatting about how we read the other day and they also some of them also listen and read at the same time so shouts to our discord mods for making me feel less weird next Step is, I'm going to call it step 1.5, because for me, step one and this step are basically the same step. I read and I annotate and I outline at the same time. And just so you all know, Dragon Riders, you know this because you have access to our episode outlines. Our outlines tend to be about 30 to 40 pages of a Google Doc. Some of them have gotten up to the 50s, like I'm looking at you, episode eight of Fourth Wing. That was really long. But for me, outlining the episodes, again, I have my three different things and I'm outlining all at the same time as reading. It takes about one to one and a half hours per 30 minutes of audio. I think the the longest episode it ever took me to outline was episode eight of Fourth Wing, which took me, I think, about nine hours to outline. That was long. That was a long one. So again, like we we do ours separately. So it's so funny because like step one for me is read the section. And then next step is step two is outlining. And each chapter takes me about two to three hours of outlining. And then the archive section takes another few hours because it involves combing through both books and looking online for details 
details I may have missed. I outline by having my ebook on one screen and the outline on the other and literally going line by line, especially seeing everything that I highlighted during my reading time. And I pull from my annotations. I refer back to other parts of the book and then of course dive into a lot of other source material as well during my outline process. Oh, that's a big thing. The search function on my ebook is a godsend because I'll go back and forth between Iron Flame and Fourth Wing. Like for instance, we're going over like Llewellyn in the next section because you know Llewellyn. Did you also? I also did that. Wing? Yes. <laughs> so like stuff like that. It just it makes it so much easier. I've had some people ask us like, why don't we like have the physical book? That's why because if that was the case, it would take me far, far, far longer. But speaking of other source material, like Lexi was saying, we incorporate a lot of theories from uh, and insights also from social tags, from comments, from videos, from emails, from Reddit's, from Rebecca Yarrow's interviews. Like we really want to make sure that we bring as much to the conversation as possible. And that means crediting others' ideas as well too, because we're just two people and we just have two brains. Why not have a hive mind for these outlines as well? And then no matter what, we're never going to catch everything. It's just every single time, there's always a million different perspectives, which is one of the things that we absolutely love about it. So we just offer several different ones or like our own personal ideas. And then of course, we love oh in the comment sections, it always builds and builds and builds off of that. Step three is recording, which takes about three and a half to four hours. And we record every single Wednesday, usually right after my kids both go down for their nap. And then I scurry on in and then Nicole and I have our four hours of recording. And then Nicole is starving at the end of it. And she's a <laughs> bitch. <laughs> and then I run out and it's like all chaos with the kids and everything. And I have to just dive in and like, you know, anyway, yeah. So Wednesdays are definitely our recording heavy days. And we just give ourselves about four hours or so. And then Nicole yeah. edits that down to between two to two and a half hours. Which speaking of step four is editing. Now this is a solo step for me, except for I'm starting, I'm starting to hand off some of my things. I'm like white knuckling holding on to <laughs> because it's so important to me. And this is a long process. I think I've gotten it to where per 20 minutes of audio, it equals about an hour of editing. And the reason is, is because I am extremely particular about my editing. And even then I still make mistakes. Like I was listening to a clip the other day and there was like a, but I, and then I restarted my sentence and I was like, God damn it. No, I forgot. It. <laughs> I was a little bit in a tizzy about that, but it's fine. But I, I also like the reason it takes me so long is because I edit a lot of things out. Like for instance, I edit out basically every breath I take during battle brief but that is because I gasp like I am a fish out of water <laughs> like during those sections and, and like for instance you know Lexi and I will sometimes go off on a tangent or something and I'll be listening to it and I'm like oh, I don't really know if this is necessary so I do edit down things just for fluidity of content then speaking of content I take clips and I edit the social content which takes a few hours this is what I'm really starting to hand off to you Lex and our uh, executive producer as well and uh, I'm quite proud of myself for delegating thank you <laughs> then I had speaking of handing things off after the episode is fully edited it's fully formatted the bloopers are in the music's in all that kind of stuff I hand off the episode to our executive producer and he does his last little audio edits mainly what's called normalizing the audio and then him and I together upload the episodes into YouTube Patreon our hosting platform all that kind of stuff add the ads all that there's a lot of steps to this process and it takes me far longer than I would like it to however it is it's a labor of love this part but that's not all <laughs> You know, besides all of that, that specifically goes into the episodes, there's, of course, managing and posting to our social media accounts. Nicole and I are the only two people who manage our social media accounts right now. So all the DMs, all of the comments, all of the posting, it is her and I. And we also have a lot of business management inquiries and discussions that are going on behind the scenes, especially now that we have hired an ad network and a talent agency, which is really exciting. We also, of course, always have lots of Patreon events like the live Q&A and trivia. We have our Discord server. Uh, of course, now we're going to be also creating the newsletter. So those are just a few of the very many things that go into the day to day of managing this brand and podcast. And then not to mention we have jobs. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> we have jobs. I am very fortunate where because I do work for myself, I do create my own hours. I have been able to go down to basically like 5% of my other job and just like the bare necessities, which I have done without blinking an eye. It's been a very good decision. But it's a lot that goes into what we do. 
However, I don't know if I would do anything different. Like I, uh, I love too. it. I yeah. love it so much. And yeah, like I'm similar where I actually left my corporate job and I switched over just to freelancing for those corporate companies that I used to work for. And so it's great that I get to manage my own hours with that as well. And I literally do have to remember that I have that other job sometimes. <laughs> um, but I also, of course, I'm a stay at home mom too. So thankfully, my husband does work remotely. We do have grandparent support, which is absolutely vital. But I take care of my kids unless they are napping or unless they're asleep, really and truly. So yes. I'm tired just listening to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move on to the next question then. Kate D asked, what have you learned about being creators along the way? Let's start on a high note. Let's start with the yes. good. The, the biggest thing is the freaking massive heart that this community has. It is unbelievably powerful. Like Lexi was saying, we do manage all of our social media. We do manage our inbox for email. We do have help from our executive producer for that, however. But like the kind messages that we get, which shocks me literally on a daily basis, multiple yeah. times a day, it, it still makes me cry and my heart swell just as much as it did on day one. So the biggest thing for me, I think, is the heart and the love that has been poured into this community and has been reciprocated back to us. And I'd even say reciprocated back to us tenfold. You all have made us cry more than you can ever imagine. Lexi and I still scream in the good her. way. In yes, the in good the, way. In the, well, <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, we'll get to the other one in a second there. But yes, this is in a good, good way. This is in a good way. But like Lexi and I still screenshot nice reviews or nice messages and send them back and forth and just dote on you all. And it just it means so much to us how it's been given back to us and that we can't tell you what that means to us. And on that same note, I am incredibly humbled that something as seemingly simple as a book discussion can be so healing for so many. I have felt this way about other content where a podcast, I'll say specifically binge mode, it served as a light during a very dark time for me. And to be able to be that light for so many listeners, it is so touching. And all we can say is thank you for letting us into your lives. Really and truly, we are honored to be part of your days. We do not take it lightly that you choose to listen to us and for us to join you in your day-to-day -day lives. And we really want to do right by all of that for this community. I think I can safely say like Lexi, your and I's life has completely done a 180. It is flipped oh, upside down in a way that we have never expected. So I still feel like a baby content creator. I still feel like there's still so much that we're learning. And luckily now I feel like we have a team of people who are guiding us in, in a really beautiful way. But like you all are the pillars that lift us up every single day. And I, I don't mean that lightly. I really don't. Yeah. Well, taking a hard pivot, let's talk about the <laughs> ugly, the things that have been maybe not as exciting to learn being the content creators that we are. I think the first and, and biggest one for me, it may be honestly even the only negative side for me, is learning how to deal with haters and trolls on the internet. I don't know how else to say it. It's been extremely challenging. I think we're still figuring out how to navigate this because oh, looking through comments and doom scrolling through comments didn't work for me. So <laughs> we are humans. And I do think that people scrolling through the internet, we do tend to forget that the people on the other side of those videos are humans as well. There have been some comments that have made me get in bed and cry. And my husband has had to hold me for like 30 minutes. Like I'm not joking. So good times. I have I have learned not to check things after a certain time in the yeah. evenings and not before a certain time in the mornings because I don't want to end my day or start the day with a bad feeling. Nicole and I are both innately people pleasers and we really just want to do our best and bring everyone happiness and value. And it is hard to accept that no matter what, no matter how good we try to do, no matter how many people we do try to adhere to, we're not going to be everyone's cup of tea. There is definitely constructive feedback, which we really and truly appreciate and try to to take into account and then there's not so constructive feedback where people really do forget that we are human just to put it simply there so yeah so definitely navigating all of that I have thin skin and getting that skin thicker all that can be done is just through practice here's something I think that we're learning from this though is really twofold number one we put together some fantasy fangirls values and yes. That alone, I don't know about you, Lex, that alone, since we did that exercise from Hayden's suggestions, shouts to you, our executive producer, Hayden, our sanity manager, we love you. That changed a lot of the way that I approached the negativity. So that has been yeah. extremely helpful. And then the second thing is realizing because we're not everyone's cup of tea, really leaning into whose voices are we listening to more? Is it the people who are sending us the love, the praise, the constructive criticism, definitely, which we do want to know because we want to make this as best as possible. Are we listening to that or are we listening to the people who are just hating on the show because they 
chose to hate on the show that day. And switching our focus to be listening to one over the other has been extremely helpful for my mental health and my just positive daily attitude. So that is something I think we're learning from this ugly side. And I think we'll continue to learn for a while. Definitely. And, you know, going back to the good and the community that is so uplifting and so wonderful when each of us do kind of get into those negative mind spaces, which definitely do happen, we are able to refer back to all of the other wonderful, positive things and be able to really hold on to that. So it's like, you know what, this one person, we might cuss a little bit too much for them, but guess what? There are hundreds, thousands of other people who have shared how much they love our show. And that's kind of what you have to hold on to. So definitely. Let's move into some questions more specifically geared towards us. Elizabeth C. They ask, how did you meet your spouses? I met Brett actually at college orientation. Him and I both went to the same school. Like our college orientation was weird it was several months before you went to the school so we met in April we didn't go back to we didn't go to campus to like start school until August so we had the whole summer to connect over Facebook and we actually ended up Skyping based yeah remember Skype this is before (laughs) Zoom was even a thing we were Skyping every single night we'd be talking to like three four in the morning then we got to school we dated for like a month and a half and I viciously broke his heart (laughs) like I was not to put it lightly I think it was multiple reasons number one I was 18 I did not want a serious relationship I wanted to have a youth I knew that he was serious relationship guy and so we actually spent five years apart barely talking and we moved to Chicago totally separately he was in casting I was an actor and his casting studio in Chicago was doing a acting for on-camera class and so he actually wrote our alumni group hey like who wants in on this class I've got a discount code and I was maybe a little inebriated at three in the morning and I responded back with (laughs) me I'd love to do it. And every single day after class, we'd end up, you know, I'd try, I'd like drive him home because I had a car. He didn't. And we lived in the same neighborhood and we would just talk for hours and hours and hours. And finally, after class, he asked me on a date. I refused to believe it was a date. I showed up with no makeup on, my glasses and my hair in a braid, still wet from my shower. Thank God (laughs) it still worked out because the rest is history after that. I love this story. It's so cute. So my husband, Jake, and I, we met through a mutual friend back in 2014. We were both living in Denver at the time. I had just gotten out of a really bad relationship and I wanted to meet my friend's hot friend who we once ran into very briefly at a bar. And so I didn't even remember his name. All I knew was that he was her really hot friend. And so I'm on the rebound and I'm like, hey that hot friend of yours, is he still single? And she's like, yeah, he is. And so we connected at her birthday dinner. And like, literally, as I'm getting into the Uber, I was like, really sad that he didn't ask for my number. But he literally was like, wait, 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 like, what's your phone number? And so then we stayed up texting all throughout the night. We had our first date hiking at Red Rocks two days later. It was the best and last first date ever for both of us. We laugh about it. Even though neither of us were looking for a relationship, you know, we were 23, 24 years old, we immediately clicked and we never played any games with one another. We knew each we liked each other we wanted to spend time with each other that was really new for our for each of our separate groups in you know your early 20s and whatnot and we just really clicked and the rest is history for us too I will never forget when you and I were texting and I was still like fueled with hatred from previous guy and you were like you were like yeah like this guy you know Jake I'm dating him I have a toothbrush at his apartment and I was like what the what what like (laughs) whoa wait this got serious like are you serious and I think I can't remember what you said after that but something in my gut was like oh this is my brother-in-law I knew it instantly I think it was when he came to Thanksgiving thinking that it was going to be a massive family event and it was like 10 people oh it wasn't it was six of us and literally <laughs> like and he comes from a huge family and so I told him we were having a very small Thanksgiving meal and we had literally been dating for just a few weeks and he didn't have anywhere to go and I felt so sorry for him so I invited him to ours not thinking he would actually say yes and he did and it's like okay well it's gonna be really small and he's like okay like that's totally fine because his idea of a really small Thanksgiving get together is like 30 plus people he thought he could just kind of sneak in get a paper plate of food and then sneak out no 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 like it was sitting down holding hands next to grandma saying what we're all <laughs> thankful for like it was so jarring for him he had he never met experienced Michael. anything yeah like he had never experienced anything like that before oh man but he was a trooper <laughs> oh I love that story so much well speaking of marriage Cassie S 
asked, is there any lesson you've learned in your marriage life so far that has been the most meaningful and helpful for your personal health slash growth? Ooh, I love this question. So this is going to sound so cliche, but it's just so true. And the answer is communication. Learning how to communicate in my marriage has not only helped my marriage and our relationship, but it directly impacts my personal growth and my mental health. You know, being able to express myself fully, know how to share my needs, frustrations and desires, and what's more, recognizing them for myself in the first place, and then figuring out how to speak them out loud in a positive, productive manner with my partner. I'm someone who lives in my head a lot, and I can be a little bit reclusive, especially when I have really big emotions going on, and it can eat me away inside, and I push my partner away, even though it's not intentional. So working through all of that with self-awareness and communication as a combined effort to always strive and always be better and do better, that's been just so essential to both my marriage and my personal mental health. You and I so are sisters because I do the same fucking thing. Like I am a <laughs> big emotions, big person. And sometimes it's really hard to, for me to actually like know how to express. And I'm gonna actually do a major plug for therapy here because having a therapist has been instrumental in me being able to literally say, what am I feeling right now? And being able to verbalize that to my partner. So I'm gonna agree with everything Lexi said, communication. I'm gonna throw therapy in the mix as well. But I'm gonna also expand and say, I think the number, I'll say like two or three thing that has been really helpful for Brett and I is, you know, he works at a startup, which is many, many, many work hours throughout the week. And I do this. So we both work a lot, which means we spend a lot of time not with each other, even though we both work from home. So we have rituals throughout the week that really zero in on the quality time that we need to have together and having that undivided attention with each other. The irony is that quality time if you're a love language person. It's neither of our number one love languages, actually. But we found that during this insane season of life, having those moments of that high quality time has been instrumental. It gives us time to reconnect, laugh, joke, dream, and just be the best friends that we are together. And that makes me happier and more refreshed all the time. Yeah, I love that. My my husband's love language is quality time. And I will say with the podcast coming into our lives, it has been very difficult for us to carve out that time together. And so that is something that I'm being really intentional about going into 2024 is having that quality time together, like what you were just saying there, because it gets hard when you got two little kids, but it still is just as important, if yeah, not more important than ever more. before. Yeah. Jake's love language is quality time. Brett's is physical touch. What is yours? Mine is physical touch as well. Really? Yeah, I know, right? You wouldn't necessarily think that, but it is definitely definitely physical touch. Because, my gosh, if I don't get a hug in a certain amount of time, I get really, like, dark and lonely. (laughs) And, like, if we're sitting together, I get really self-conscious if he's not, like, holding my hand. Or, like, I need that physical touch. And I'm not saying, like, in an intimate sexual way even, but just, like, I need that comfort and that love. And I am such a snuggler. I love it. That is not in the slightest what I was expecting to hear from you but that does check out mine is acts of service so like if Brett brings me a coffee or whenever he takes out the trash or something like that when like because you know my plate is I'm always filling up my plate if I have a smidgen bit of a sliver I will fill it more and you and Hayden are actually very good at reeling me back which I really oh my god I know Nicole's like okay we gotta do another bonus episode it's like no I physically can't do that Nicole (laughs) I bite off a little more than I can chew sometimes so to have someone who can help me out and like and even whether it's asked or not asked it's always really appreciated so definitely acts of service gifts is also my like that's my second one I'd say gifts is my very close second but not like Prada bags or anything like I love like like my favorite thing I've ever received ever is a cookbook that has a handwritten note from Brett in it like that is like Aww. that right there like I love cooking so that's really important to me so like the really meaningful personalized gifts is huge yeah Yeah, that makes sense. So on the same line of thinking, a lot of people asked us, do we have any goals slash resolutions for 2024? This is very apt considering this is a January 24 episode. You know, I'm not a huge New Year's resolution person, but I am very mindful going into the new year with intentions. I realize I guess that's the same thing. The phrasing, however, for me at least, makes it feel a little bit more open-ended. My intentions into the new year, they don't feel like I have to measure them, but they're just very mindful. And I definitely believe in measurable goals but this is like when you got two little kids and everything's just as chaotic as it is 
I don't hold myself to that. In these years, in this season of life, I go for intentions and mindfulness. So several of mine are, I have a lot, but just a few of them here to share. One is being more present with my partner, Jake. I just mentioned, you know, how the podcast, it does eat up a lot of time and his love language is quality time. And we really have been lacking that in the last several months. And I'm excited to carve out more intentional time to spend with my husband, my best friend. So I'm really excited about that for 2024. A second one here that I've also kind of mentioned is getting that tougher skin. I don't mean this as a negative by any means, just simply that as this brand grows and develops, there are going to be naysayers and I can't let them get to me when there's so much positivity and happiness to focus on. I really do think that this just goes with practice and I'll call it mindset training and just growing tougher skin as a result of that to really let the negativity bounce off. And last but not least, number three is getting into a sustainable routine in this hectic life as a stay-at-home working mom. There's a lot on the horizons for both work and personal life for this year and I very much I prefer order and routine or my brain it is already really scattered but is even more scattered so I really want to be more intentional about how I go about my daily life I am looking for a schedule a routine that I can rely on so there's fewer decisions to make every day so that I can just kind of know what to expect for myself so that I can have more of a, a focus there throughout the day each and every day I'm also not a super new year's resolutions person for those of you who don't know I used to work or I technically still do work in goal setting for high achievers and perfectionists and so as a part of my other job I was deep in you know the statistics behind goal setting and specifically new year's resolutions and to be honest they ain't good so I never really liked to lean into the new year's resolutions they just never really were appealing to me especially with the follow-through rate that being said I am a major goal slash dream person. One of the questions we got for this actually, I'm sorry, I don't have it next to this, so I can't give it credit, but it was, what is your Enneagram number? Mine is a three. I am the high achiever. That's just, that's who I've always been in my life. That being said, however, I always used to end the year with like a four to five hour writing exercise of what I learned from this past year, remembering the highs and the lows and remembering things that you just like totally forget about that were like, oh yeah, January, 2023, I did this thing and I totally forgot about it. And then also sitting down and mapping out the year ahead. But This is actually the first time in many, 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 many years that I haven't done this exercise or written out goals or done a vision board or anything like that. And the main reason is because I truly have no idea for the first time in my life, I have no idea what to expect from this year. In the past three months, four months, really, things that I have always dreamed of happened and I don't say that lightly. I say that still in disbelief and like having to pinch myself every single day and remind myself that this is real life. And this is really the first time I feel like I'm just kind of along for the ride. Hold on, everyone. I don't think you realize how big of a deal that is for Nicole to say, oh my gosh. (laughs) Like, can I tell you, when I told my therapist this, she literally jumped out of her seat and clapped for joy. Like, she was so excited. Like, that's what I want to do here too. It's like, wow. (laughs) Not to get too sappy, but... Being someone, you know, there, there was a reason I used to teach and coach perfectionists is because I am still a recovering perfectionist and I'm never hiding that. I, you heard my monologue about editing. I am still dealing with my perfectionism. That being said, I always used to want to have a goal and always used to like white knuckle try to get there as fast as possible and beat myself up because I wasn't there yet. Like that was just kind of a default for me. And the fact that this is the first time in my life where I feel so happy and so comfortable in the present moment like I'm gonna cry I can't overstate that now with all of this said I do have like Lexi was saying I do have intentions that I want to bring in this year but it's not like my smart goals or I'm, I'm actually like this past year I've really kind of stepped away from the actionable measurable time specific like the really quantitative goals I've really stepped away from them and I've encouraged people who I work with to do that as well and it's been really helpful for them so I've actually really stepped away from that so I'd say like my intentions for this year are around what I want for the podcast we've mentioned that earlier I'm going on my honeymoon this year so I have like you know ideas of like how we're gonna plan that and like what we're gonna do and all this kind of stuff and then of course work-life balance I guess if you could say anything that is really like my goal for the next month or so I'm not really looking beyond February though like that's kind of because I truly again I truly just don't know what to expect this year and I I don't want to get ahead of myself and and go too far so I I really do want to lean into finding more of that like that step away time taking care of myself getting back into my daily healthy habits I'm someone who does lean into those a lot more and that's kind of like my set my center of gravity to be like violet for a second um and when the podcast took off it really did go to the wayside and I'm feeling that in my daily energy in my in my day-to-day life so that is really like my intention for the next chapter is just to kind of find that 
more balance, but I really don't have any of those like, look at me now goals I used to have. And all of these just feel like small adjustments I get to make it one at a time. And I'm proud. I'm excited. I feel like I, the same way with the podcast, it's, it happened all so quickly and my routine that I did have really got thrown off. And so now that it is, I don't know if I'll say leveling out, but now that we're at least getting adjusted to it on a day-to-day schedule here, we are starting to ask for more help from other people as it does continue to scale and grow at the rate that it is. I just need to get outside more. Like I am such an outside person. I want to start running a little bit more again. I just need to go back to like my daily walks, but yes. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm going to add that to the, what is something you've learned as, as a con content creator asking for help because Lexi and I are very scrappy do-it-ourselves people yep. and learning to lean on our team ask for help from our mods has been really challenging but the more and more we practice it the more and more easy it gets it just doesn't like that's never going to be our first thought is we should no. ask for help like it's like we're in it so much in ourselves and now it's like oh my gosh like we need to ask for help more yeah. like we we need more help if it's going to continue growing at the rate that it is so. well and especially now that we have help that have resources that quite frankly we just don't have in our back pocket yeah. it's hard to remember it's really hard yes. to remember sometimes <laughs> Megan asks what are your favorite non-book related things to do in your free time because that is such an intention for this year I'm gonna I'm gonna say what I'm excited to bring into my free time this year I am a spa whore I <laughs> love like quite frankly it's not something I do regularly just because funds and all that kind of stuff but whenever I do it it is one of my favorite things like for instance one of my best friends Brittany is coming into town in a few weeks and her and I are going to one of my favorite spas that's a rooftop in the middle of the mountains it is so bougie and so wonderful and I love it so much and so her and I are doing that and that's like that is just like my favorite treat myself activity but like I love going on adventures I love doing classes that like get me out of my comfort zone I love doing like spin classes or I used to take uh, circus aerial arts and that's something I'd love to get back into is like doing fabrics and stuff like that but I I think like my hobby I guess I, I love video games I am really good at them like when I say I've logged over a thousand hours I'd actually even probably go 1500 hours on Zelda Breath of the Wild and probably over a thousand hours on Tears of the Kingdom I'm not fucking around (laughs) like I'm dead (laughs) serious really moral of the story is do not challenge me to Mario Kart (laughs) like I am really good yeah this was supposed to be my free time hobby hobby well <laughs> oops it, does going on walks and going to the park with my kids count like yeah. I, I barely consider that free time hobby because going to the park with two toddlers is no joke but <laughs> my little family does love to go on adventures we love to go around town we love to go up to the mountains we love to go to play places for the kids we love to explore new restaurants my husband and I like we love to get dressed up and go out to like a swanky happy hour as well like that's like our nice little thing to do or sometimes like after we put the kids down my parents will watch them like well he and I go get like a late night dinner that's really wonderful too so I I guess that's what I do in my free time there is I love to go out and explore really good restaurants and take the kids out to run around and play but I also really love to listen to audiobooks while I'm trying to 100% complete Hogwarts Legacy (laughs) I am so close I'm at 80% I beat the game so now I'm just going around and trying to get all of the stupid Merlin trials (laughs) and all those other little things but it's so nice because it's like I don't have to think much about it I can listen to my audiobook and it's my nice little transition from work mode to bedtime and it's like at midnight every single night so I love that for you so much I'm so (laughs) proud of you that makes me so happy Jade S asked have you both always been active readers as in theorizing as you read and guessing along the way or did this develop after a specific age slash book so I was a very avid reader growing up and then I stopped for the most part in college which was about you know 10 years ago and then I only really got back into it especially the reading part with Akatar. However, I was super into the Game of Thrones theorizing and deep dives in the 2010s, you know, when Game of Thrones was what it was. I admired these content creators specifically on YouTube who broke it all down and I consumed that content like crazy. Oh my gosh, I just ate it all up. And I always thought, wow, it would be so cool to do something like this. Like, I just like, I loved that nerdy now content creation, just combining all of my loves all together. Genuinely did not think it would actually happen, though. Like, oh my God. (laughs) My AP literature teacher in high school, she taught me to think critically about books. She is also now a family friend, and she was coincidentally neighbors with my parents for a while there. And she has proudly been following along on this journey of ours. I really do credit a lot of my book analytical training to her. I was also really big in Harry Potter theorizing between books back in middle school and high school. You have to remember 
these books, there were a few years in between the releases. And so this was also like an early internet days too. So, oh my gosh, the theorizing, like it was so much fun back then. And it's so crazy to see how much everything has changed in the, what, 20 years since then. Can you imagine if the Harry Potter releases had TikTok? Lord. <laughs> oh boy, I know, right? Well, I, you know, I have a whole other tangent about this that I won't get into right now, but I do not think that the books would have been nearly as popular. Author controversies aside, yeah. I do wonder if the books would have been as popular. To answer this question, I was not an active <laughs> reader. Like I actually, and I, I don't say this lightly, I fucking hated reading growing up. I was the spark note queen. I never read a book for school. It, it really, the deep down therapeutic answer is it made me extremely anxious. It was really hard for me to sit down and read, like to stand up and read. You remember like those class exercises where you had to like stand up and read a passage and it was like almost popcorn style. I think that was 90% of my panic attacks in high school. Like, it was because of that <laughs> exercise. I hated it, quite frankly. So it wasn't really until like I got into Twilight when I learned to actually enjoy reading but in no means was I thinking critically about the books I was just like "Mm, dreamy this is a morally gray person it wasn't until 2020 really when audiobooks I started getting into those I was really listening to a lot of like personal growth slash psych books for my other job but in 2020 I listened to Harry Potter audiobooks for the first time and I've basically had them on loop for years but again it wasn't thinking critically about these books I listened to podcasts over that I listened to other content creators that were you know deep dive and analyzing these books very much how we do fantasy fangirls there was a whole thing for Harry Potter and for Game of Thrones that I gobbled up and I loved it so I really relied on other people to do the critical thinking for me Now, granted, I did get a theater degree. So a lot of my, you know, like play analysis classes, those were deep diving into the backs of stories. And like as an actor, you have to do that for your own characters. I think that was where my training came from. I just didn't really think about it transferring into books. So it wasn't really until I started reading ACOTAR back in July of this year, like this is very new, when I would say that I became a quote unquote active reader. Now there's not a day that goes by without me listening to a book. But still on the first read of any book, I do not think critically about things. I am just like, take me off, take me wherever you want to go. And it's now really on the second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. rereads that I'm really thinking critically. I'm thinking about the theorizing. I think a, a huge credit of that is actually to fantasy fangirls. Like back in August, I would never have thought that I was a critical thinker when it comes to storytelling in, in the slightest. Like I would have actually very actively thought the opposite. So this has been a huge, I'll, I'll say confidence booster for me as a critical thinker. So thanks fantasy fangirls. I think you're very good at it, Nicole. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I think I'm better at it now. I have confidence now. <laughs> Erica M. asks, what is our favorite book of all time? I have to go with Mist and Fury. That was a book that shocked me to my core. And I literally could not put it down. And it was probably the biggest book book hangover I've ever had so I'm gonna I'm gonna go favorite book of all time I have the right to change my mind but right now it is Mist and Fury So I'm going to have two different answers here. First of all, Mist and Fury is definitely up there for me. I just did my re-listen to it, and uh, it is just so beautiful. If I can include fantasy, I'm going to have to go with Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. We got other variations of this question here, and it was like, if you don't include fantasy, if you don't include Harry Potter. So this is my including every single book that is out there. Got to say Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. If it is not fantasy, I'm going to take a hard left turn and say the power of one. I love historical fiction where you follow the protagonist as they grow up. And I believe that this book is just an absolute masterpiece. It is so different from anything that we would ever cover here. Another comfort book along these same lines is Memoirs of a Geisha. That's definitely another one of my favorite comfort books. I've never read that book, actually. You would love it. It's a beautiful love story. Ooh, I probably would love it. Yes. Now, okay, so if we're going non-fantasy, I'm going to throw two out there, and that is number one, Limitless by Jim Quick. Everything I've learned about productivity, which is like my my specialty, I I would say, other like outside of fantasy fangirls, like that is really where my niche of genius comes from. Everything I've learned is from that book, and that sparked new research and everything like that. So I love that book. I'm also going to go with The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. It is a dry read, friends. It is like studies about rats. Like it's not funny. It's not fascinating. It's very different from what we cover here. But the exercises and the strategy that I learned from that book has quite literally transformed my life. I'm someone who's known 
outside of the in the past four months I'm known for having really solid foundational habits something I really pride myself on and everything I learned was from that book Atomic Habits is another big one but James Clear even admits that the foundation of Atomic Habits is from Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg so I'm going to go with the OG habit book so if we're going down that road I'm going to add to that and I know this is another one of your favorites too is Better Than Before by Gretchen Rubin so that is another fantastic nonfiction habit development I love Gretchen Rubin she's a fantastic author and researcher and I love how she brings everything together and there's never any one solution and she's really great at understanding every single person is different and tapping into what makes you tick what helps you as a person and then going from there to structure your habits I read that book about once a year just as a nice little refresher and I think I'm due for it actually I'm going to, like, just for backstory and everyone, Lexi and I grew up in the personal development world. However, Lexi and I believe in personal development from a place of what works best for you. I always say personal development is personal. And I want to echo Gretchen Rubin. Also, her Four Tendencies book is literally a life changer. I should have said this during the marriage question. That book changed Brett and I's relationship for the better. Ours as well. Yes. And so a lot. So, Nicole, you like to joke about how my husband is just like Zayden. If you read the Four Tendencies, tendencies and understand what the rebel tendency is that is how you will know how my husband and Zayden are essentially the same person (laughs) yeah literally exactly so ah Gretchen Rubin you have my heart and soul I love her Amanda L asked what are your favorite tropes I mean enemies to lovers like that has to be number one that if anyone is like it's an enemies to lovers book I'm like gimme I want it like I would totally read it I'm also gonna throw faded mates into that conversation forced proximity I loved that and then of course the one bed at the inn if they get to an inn and there is one fucking bed I do a little giddy girl legs kicking up in the air fluttering dance it's my favorite it's my fucking favorite well we do have a lot of overlapping favorites so which of course go figure right and so mine are also enemies to lovers so love that forced proximity there and then outside of romance and then outside of romance honing slash training their powers and potential. I love that for our hero's journey. Also, when I think about some of my favorite fantasy books, I'll add in Chosen One and, of course, Vast World Building and Exploration and Mystery. Oh, my gosh. I did not realize how much I love Mystery until I read Crescent City One. So I am not a true crime person in the slightest. However, the mystery true crime aspect of Crescent City has me in a chokehold that I was not expecting. So I'm going to I'm going to echo that. Oh, I love this question. Unapologetic Dane apologist. Great handle on Discord, by the way, asked to Lexi specifically, any tips slash tricks for balancing motherhood with starting this new business and other responsibilities? I have three kiddos and am in the midst of starting a business too. E, so exciting. And I will take all the tips. Well, first of all, congratulations on starting a business. It is no small feat. And just to even take that initial step of making the decision and making it happen is something to give a big round of applause for. I could honestly do a whole episode on this answer. I've even done a few social media videos on this too. But to keep it somewhat short, my best advice is to focus on your time management. When there is this many balls to juggle, you're going to drop more than a few. It's nothing bad. It is just a fact. As you launch your business and figure out what is doable within a 24-hour time frame, it is so important to recognize which balls are plastic and can fall to the wayside versus what's glass and has to keep juggling. For instance, I I can count on about an hour of work during my kids overlapping nap time every day and then I get the rest of my daily work done between 7 and 11 p.m. That's most days for me about five days a week. That's simply what works for me because I can't count on work before the kids wake up since they are up hopefully they sleep until five like that's literally hoping that they sleep till 5 a.m. I don't say this as a deterrence it's just from my own experience but yeah I don't really sleep everybody knows that. (laughs) I don't sleep. Thank you to everyone who sent us coffee. Lexi has really appreciated yeah. it. No, like you've actually sent us coffee. It was the sweetest thing ever. And thank you. And in fact, I made a joke last night because I was in the outline when I had told Nicole I was going to sleep. And she commented like, you know, within the Google Doc because she caught me in there. And she's like, woman, go to sleep. And I posted it to social media. And then I was answering a few DMs. And multiple people were like, Lexi, go to sleep. <laughs> 
thank you all for watching out for my mental health. I also couldn't do this without our strong support system. Jake, my husband, he works remotely too. And taking care of the kids throughout these days, it really is a joint effort. We also moved back from Oregon to Colorado because we knew we'd need help with two under two. And now we live close to grandparents and Nicole, of course, too, who all help as well. You know, if I have meetings or recordings outside of nap time hours. So with that said, asking and accepting help if it is available to you, it is huge when you're a mom and growing your business and just getting it started to scaling it and all of the above. I also, you know, you also got to cut corners where you can. I do grocery pickups and we use HelloFresh. I do easy phone work like social media while I'm nursing or other, I'll say simple tasks where I can just kind of jump on my phone there really quickly. And I've also just gotten really good at squeezing in tasks wherever I can instead of doom scrolling. I have really just stopped doom scrolling. I don't dilly dally on my phone or really anything like I it's also detrimental to my relaxation but like I am always doing something I am always squeezing something in because there is no time to spare oh that makes me so happy to hear I love that I love that you're doing that (laughs) I I want everyone to take a moment and just like dote on Lexi as much as I do on a daily basis because literally (laughs) the fact that she's able to I I don't want to say do it all because I don't think anyone can like you are able to accept help and like really lean on that and it's that's no small thing I'm I'm in awe of you constantly I love you Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's it really comes down to figuring out what works best for you, recognizing and accepting that this is also a season and that this is not going to be for the rest of your life. It really is kind of that push period there. And also remembering your why. There are times where it's like, I am tired and I am not excited to go into Bizguyeth, but it's like, I, I, I can easily get into the right mindset and it's just diving into it. And then, you know, then I'm fully into it, you know, within a few minutes. Next up, we have a few questions about each other. Multiple people actually asked a variation of what is your favorite and or funniest memory together? We didn't singular memory this. We multiple memory this, by oh, the yes. way. <laughs> Can't pick one. I'm thinking back specifically on this past year and I am going to exclude anything podcast related here because we've talked a lot about our relationship and as close as we were before now we're business partners and podcast hosts together and it has taken our relationship to a whole new level there but just thinking back on outside of that Nicole's bachelorette weekend this past May was definitely a core memory for us as sisters Nicole and Brett they wanted to do a joint bachelorette weekend so I organized an epic tournament all weekend we got an Airbnb in San Diego and there were about eight of us mostly siblings some really really close friends there were four teams of two and we had what eight ten games throughout the weekend and it ranged from a scavenger hunt on the beach to mario kart to trivia to a cooking competition if you've ever seen guys grocery games i totally replicated it off of that and so nicole and i we were a team we were called the flying foxes f-a-w-k-e-s i thought it was fox flying fox like flying fucks no, it was like from the Phoenix. Oh, I was definitely going off of we were the flying fox. <laughs> no, it was Fox the Phoenix. Well, yeah, we spelled it that way, but I thought it was a, like... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> we had so much fun playing these games all weekend long as a team together, and that was definitely a core memory for me. My husband and his team partner, they were the Malortmen. Malortmen. <laughs> Malortmen. Malortmen. They had a theme song and everything. <laughs> they dominated the weekend. They absolutely annihilated everyone. It was so, That was so fun. Oh, my God. Although you and I also excelled in the scavenger hunt. That we was did. another really part, good part of us. Yeah, we were very... Uh, this is going to shock a lot of people. We were very strategic strategic and efficient with that. Yes, we were. Another random wonderful memory is when Nicole and I saw Frozen 2 together. I don't remember what year this was. Whenever it came out. Was it 2019? Okay. It was December 2019. And, and Nicole and I, shock of shocks, we really connected as Anna and Elsa from the first movie. And so we made a pact to wait until we were reunited for Christmas to see the second one in theaters together. We were really excited to see it, but we we're like, no, we're going to wait to see it together. And that was the most fun movie experience of all time. We laughed, we cried, we sang, we held each other through the entire movie. People were looking at us like we were absolutely crazy, like no joke. And it was one of my favorite memories together, not just from a movie going standpoint, but just like favorite memories together. I was also going to say this one because when Elsa rode the water horse. Lexi has always been in love with horses. She had them growing up. It is her spirit animal through and through. And I have when, a tattoo of a horse. Yeah, literally. She has a, yeah, like literally a tattoo of the horse. And when Elsa rode the horse, her and I were at the top row of the theater 
like holding on to each other for dear life, crying uncontrollably. And I remember being there was a five year old, like around a five year old, sitting like a few seats down from us, just like staring at us, like, "Are you ladies okay?" I oh love that. Oh my moment. gosh! And then when they did each of their big songs, like towards the end, like we both resonated with each of them so much. And oh my gosh, we were just absolute puddles, just absolute puddles. Oh my god! And when they like came together, and it's like Anna, because like I really resonate as Anna. You really resonated. I mean, obviously Anna's like the hopeless romantic she's all like it really it, it's so fun how those how that was oh that was such a good memory obviously everything around the podcast and I'm actually gonna say everything leading up to the podcast like yes. you and I would sometimes go several weeks even several months without talking to each other just we just always had that relationship just busy. yeah just yeah busy. and when you started reading Akatar, let me actually rephrase that when I forced you to start reading Akatar, <laughs> we started exchanging multiple dozens if not up to 50 plus to even 100 texts a day about books books and that was just so fun I'm actually gonna throw out one more memory and that was when you were pregnant with your son your firstborn I flew out to Oregon yes. and I came to visit and we you know we decorated the nursery it was a Harry Potter themed nursery shock of shocks <laughs> and we like we sat there on the floor and also one one night I think we were actually watching Frozen 1 I believe and you and I were like on the couch and snuggling and I was like holding your belly and you know your son kicked and we got to feel it together and we were like <gasps> Like we like oh, gasped and like yeah, looked at I each other. Like that. just that that entire trip, getting to see you, obviously you and I connecting and like getting that quality time together, but like getting to see you as you transitioned into this entirely different chapter of your life was so unbelievably special to me. And you are such a fantastic, amazing mom. Oh, and you. seeing you in that moment, I was like, Oh my God, she is going to beyond excel at this. It was so cool. Oh, thank you. We're getting so sappy here. I know. Speaking of sappy, <laughs> Erica M. asked, what is your favorite thing about each other? Now, Lexi and I, in our outlines, both hid this from each other. So we have no idea what each other is going to say. So don't look as I'm reading. This, I'm not Lexi. looking. I'm not looking. I literally <laughs> scrolled away just now. Can I make through this without crying? I don't know if I can. My favorite thing about Lexi is Lexi is one of the most caring people you could ever have in your life. And what I love most about her though is that you are my shoulder to cry on you are my shoulder to go to but I love that you always give me simultaneously the most caring advice the most caring you know retorts but also you are very objective you don't side with me just because I'm your sister you give me very clear and and non-sided and I always want that like you know like we, we've always talked about like how much we love Ree and how great of a friend she is like you are Re in my mind Aww. like you are so good at lifting me up while simultaneously Simultaneously also giving it to me straight and I but you have this incredible gift of making me feel unbelievably loved while doing so and I don't know anyone else who has that superpower I'm going to give a quick example because this is very apt actually to the podcast so over the summer I went to a podcasting conference and for those of you who don't know I have another podcast that I've had for five years and it is nowhere near the size of this show and I went into this podcast conference like wanting to learn some stuff. However, I went into this conference and I just got my ass handed to me. It felt like every panel I went to was talking about numbers and talking about revenue and all these different things where it was just like my show was not even close to that. And I felt quite frankly, very discouraged and very sad. And on my way home, I called Lexi and I I was a fucking mess. Like I was bawling my stinking eyes out. And Lexi, you said to me, first of all, you you were so kind and wonderful around, you know, conferences are hard. Like you really, they you, are. You, you just made me feel <laughs> so loved and so seen. While also you said to me, you said, little one, Nikki, you are getting the foundation for something. You are learning something here. And don't you fucking let those other people tell you how to measure it. And it was something along those lines. And it was just so motivational, it was so encouraging while also being supportive. And like that moment, I mean, yeah, it was the foundation for something but it was no nothing what we thought of and it turns out I drove you in it with me but, I was not expecting that but sure <laughs> but you just have this incredibly big heart and like the the Hufflepuff in you that really has a heart times a million I'm going to give a few more things because I can dote on you for hours but I'll hold it back a little bit and that is you do not half-ass anything you are a full asser Lexi and <laughs> 
like you all, I have no idea, like I said earlier, how she does everything with, with fantasy fangirls and is also an incredibly amazing mother. I think that it's because you do not half-ass anything in your life and you truly inspire me daily. So there's my favorite things about you because I cannot pick one. That is so sweet. Thank you, Nicole. I love you. I love you too. So similarly, I hit it because I saw that Nicole hit it. So I was like, well, of course I have to hide whatever I'm about to say about her too here. Nicole has more heart and perseverance and strength and sunshine than anyone else I know. And it just like radiates off of her the moment she steps into any room. I'm sure you all can imagine. You see it just off on screen. Imagine Nicole entering a room. Like it is just radiating off of her. And Nicole makes her dreams happen. She's being so shy about it, but her business that she has been working on for five years she had no idea how to start a business. She had no idea how to start things up with social media or be a coach or any of those things. And you made it happen. And you never quit, even when that felt like the safe option or, or the easy thing to do. And you have always stepped up. You similarly, you don't half-ass anything. You, you full-ass everything, everything, to the point where sometimes I'm like, okay, me too, but let's like be realistic <laughs> assers here. <laughs> You are the biggest go-getter I've ever met. And I'm just so proud of what you have accomplished against all the odds and how hard you work on just a everyday basis and the happiness that you get from what you do, whether it is fantasy fangirls or your other job or whatever it might be. Like you only do things that really bring you joy and it's because you go all in with them. And I really admire that about you. I'm going to cry. Thank you. you know, I love <laughs> Damn it, Erica. Like, How dare you ask a question <laughs> like this? It's really special to be able to do this together and yeah. be business partners together. We're officially a business now. We made it official. Yeah, we did. Yeah. It's so funny. I like, we never expected, obviously never expected anything like this, but like Lexi and I compliment each other in ways we never would have known. Like everything that I despise in business or I'm not good at, quite frankly, she overly excels at. And I do think vice versa and any gaps yes. we, we fill in and that that is something I did not expect us to be so you know yin and yang to which was really cool so now let's move to some rapid fire questions let's start with Ashley R how far apart are we in age we are three years apart and Lexi is older and I am younger hey big sisters yeah and then Kate asked this question for Nicole what are some of your favorite plays that you've performed in I'm gonna go twofold I loved doing the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee that is still one of my favorite shows I've ever done I was Logan which is the lisp girl not far off from my daily life but that's fine (laughs) I also loved Medium Allison in Fun Home that was the last show I ever did it has a very 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 special place in my heart and then R Lupin oh I love that oh hey and then goes right into this favorite Harry Potter film and and why? Nicole, what do you think first? Ooh, I'm going to go most well done. I think it's Prisoner of Azkaban. But my favorite is Deathly Hallows Part 1. Yeah, Prisoner of Azkaban is definitely one of the better well done ones. So I'm going to have to go with Sorcerer's Stone, the OG one. Mostly because of the nostalgia and the memories from when it first came out. Like, it was such a big deal. It was such a big Harry Potter girl. And, you know, I was like, what, 11, 12 years old. And it was like a whole thing for my best friend's birthday party. And I just absolutely love that one. And I also feel like it's one of the most books to movie accurate adaptions because I am definitely one of those people who is very much like, that's not how it happened in the books. So yes, I am one of those snobs. Speaking of, the follow-up question from our Lupin here is, what are our thoughts on the upcoming HBO Harry Potter series? I'm going to go with so excited. I cannot wait. I am really ready to get more time on screen to explore all the aspects that the movies, quite frankly, just couldn't cover. And I don't think they they would have been able to with the medium that they were in. So things like Peeves, Spew, more Dobby. I'm uh, it's to- S-P-E-W, Nicole. I'm going with Ron Weasley because I'm wearing my Gryffindor sweater right now. And I know <laughs> that that's still her money, but I don't care. It will be weird. I'll be honest. It will be weird seeing someone other than Daniel Radcliffe play Harry Potter. But I don't really care. I really love the idea of him and Tom Felton coming in and playing the dads. Like, I think that's a really cool idea, but I'm unbelievably excited. Now I'm going to put a little caveat. This is not so much rapid fire. Sorry about it, but I would love anything from the Harry Potter world. What I hope for after this or simultaneously with the HBO show is the founding of Hogwarts. I would love to see the four founders. I would die. I would die for the Marauders and their time at school. I think that would be 
fascinating. Yes, all of what you just said. I am so excited for this TV series. What I was just saying, I'm, I'm a little bit of a book snob when it comes to the Harry Potter movies and whatnot. And I agree that it'll have so much more time and pacing to explore everything we love about the Wizarding World and these characters. I have a really good feeling about it. And I believe that the series is going to get a lot right that a lot of people, including myself, did have issues with in the movies. And also, don't get me wrong. Like, I love the movies. They are like a comfort movie and all of that. But if I had to choose between listening to the audiobook or the Harry Potter movies, and I will always choose the audiobook, I would probably also choose watching Lord of the Rings movies versus watching the Harry Potter movies too. Yeah. Just I think that, and then there are the Lord of the Rings book fans who think that those movies were terribly done too. So like that's, it. anyway, we all have our preferences. Um, I also do think that, you know, it's HBO. So it has the money and it has the ability to make the magic truly come to life, which I do think the movies did a great job of as well. Now, do you think they're going to be dragons or wyverns? for the first task in the fourth I guess it'll be the fourth season I that'll probably be wyverns it will absolutely be wyverns. <laughs> it will definitely be wyverns <laughs> that is what HBO does perfectly they do From wyverns like mwah <laughs> they do yes, such yes. good wyverns <laughs> alright moving on Leslie R asks now that you are both reading more books in the mass first which are the three series from Sarah J Mass what is your favorite book slash series and we'll just go ahead and preface this is spoiler free we will not be yes. saying any spoilers here I want to also preface this with a disclaimer around Throne of Glass. So I started the Throne of Glass series when everything with fantasy fangirls was popping off and, and I was living very deeply in the fourth wing world. So it was really hard for me to get into Throne of Glass and get the foundation there. And I think that really hindered my experience in the le- later half of the series where I really enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong, but I had a really hard time connecting with the characters because the foundation, quite frankly, wasn't there. So I want to say this disclaimer, I'm really excited to reread it and I think I'm going to enjoy it a lot more on the second round. Now I'm going to go series ranking first and I have the right to change my mind when I reread Tog. Akatar has got to go first. It was a series that stole my heart. Crescent City is fabulous. I'm rereading House of Earth and Blood right now and I'm just, I'm in love with it. And then Throne of Glass. And again, I have the right to change my mind. Now my top three, because I'm not going to choose a favorite. I'm just going to go top three of every book in the Sarah J Mass first. And again, I have the right to change my mind is A Court of Mist and Fury. So the second book in the Avatar world, House of Earth and Blood. I love the setup. I love how everything's going now, especially that I'm rereading it. I'm like, oh, all this world building makes so much sense now. It's so cool. And I am one of those Fruit Loops who really do, en- who really did enjoy the first Akatar book. I'll say more of the reasons why when we do cover that book in the podcast, but I really enjoyed that book and I'm excited to cover it for the show. I haven't read Throne of Glass yet. I know I'm crazy, but I, so I have to obviously exclude that from my roundup here. I do actually have a feeling that Tog is going to be one of my favorites just from everything I've heard about it. And I'm really excited to like be in the right mind space because it really there is a lot about the mind space that you are in when you start these series. I love the world and characters the most in the Akatar series, specifically Mist and Fury. That is definitely what my favorite out of all of her books. But I love the plots of Crescent City. And I think I actually love those plots a little bit more than the Akatar series. I'm about halfway through Crescent City 2 and I'm still getting used to the urban modern fantasy world I'm realizing that while it totally makes sense for Crescent City urban fantasy is I guess not my favorite setting in fantasy books but I'm obsessed with everything else about it so my answer like I said is going to be Mist and Fury because of the characters and the places it introduces us to that we just absolutely fall in love with there is a reason that is such a popular book series and you really start learning why in book two I do know a lot of people ask like what's our favorite of the Tog universe so if obviously Lexi can't answer this yet she will eventually Uh, I'm gonna go Queen of Shadows that book was like the one that I was like oh things are starting to really make sense I really like this Spiral asked have you both read Twilight and if yes team Edward or team Jacob yes and absolutely team Edward 10 out of 10 So yes, I've also read these books. I'm not like as crazy about Twilight. Like when I think about like, you know, like young adult fantasy, of course I think about Twilight, but like I liked the books. I definitely read all of them, but I was not like, it was not like my series like it was for so many others. So I prefer Jacob's character. And yes, that is partly because he looks like my husband. I don't think the guy ever had a chance though. Like when I think about Team Edward or Team Jacob, like there, (laughs) it was just Edward. Like, I'm sorry, poor (laughs) Jacob never really had a chance. So I'm just way too annoyingly logical as you all know (laughs) god i love you (laughs) let us wrap up this bonus episode with a few specific questions for lexi that 
many people asked variations of. Lexi, who was the child actor you dated in LA? Oh man, it is about to be a blast from the past for our (laughs) millennial listeners here. So his name is Sam and he was Butch the Bully in Little Rascals. And he was also the main boy character in Mary-Kate and Ashley's Billboard Dad movie. He did a bunch of voiceovers, including Sam on Rocket Power from Nickelodeon. He was a reoccurring role on 7th Heaven. His sister was a regular on it. She was also an absolutely lovely person. And he did some other 90s TV and movies. He's also an incredibly talented musician and that is how we met when his band regularly performed at the bar that I worked at and again this was like 10 plus 11 12 years ago it was soon after I graduated college when I moved to LA I was only there for three months that is totally a different story for another day I hope he's doing well these days so shout out to you Sam wherever you are in this world speaking of the celebs that have been in your life. What is the story behind Ryan Gosling? Okay, so first, I, we need to take a step back and give a little bit of context here. So it's 2007, and my best friend, who was a few years older than me, was close friends with a guy who was originally from Colorado, like us, but he was now a play director in Los Angeles. He wanted to do a play in Boulder, so he brought actors over, and they put on a show in Boulder, Colorado. One of the actors, he was close friends with Ryan Gosling, and it's my understanding that they were dating the McAdam sisters at the time. Okay, so now that we've laid out the context there, on closing night, Ryan flew out to see his buddy Zach perform. And there was the cast party afterward, like normal after closing nights are. And my best friend Molly and I were invited to join because again, she was close with the director. And we got to hang out with the actors at the cast party at some swanky restaurant. And we all went on to the town afterward, including going to a club. Again, like my friend and I were pretty much just tagging along. Like nobody was telling us to go away and we were not going to go away willingly. (laughs) Yes, my friend and I, we were underage, but the manager of the club let us in because I'm just assuming that he wanted these actors in the club. I don't honestly know the details about it. And the agreement, however, was that if we're allowed in, we do not drink, which I'm going to give a very clear statement here. We did not I am making it very clear that Ryan nor any other actor gave us any alcohol. And so I'm at my first club and I'm all awkward like one would be. And this just, you know, creeper comes up and he starts hitting on me. And I was so uncomfortable. I did not know what to do. I had never been in a situation like this before. So Ryan comes over and he saves me by pretending that like we were there together. So like, you know, he put his arm around me and he started up a there you are. I've been looking for you conversation, making it clear for this creep to just back off. And he very nicely got me out of the situation and he made sure I was okay and he told me to stay close to the group <laughs> so he said stay uh, with the pack <laughs> yes <laughs> I shared this super blurry photo of it in our Discord channel. I cannot believe I found it, but there it is. And again, like when I say like this is a long time ago, like it was taken with an actual digital camera and then printed from like a Walgreens or something. So (laughs) there you go. I feel like people just learned so much about you in five minutes. (laughs) All right, folks, that covers this bonus episode. If you want to hear another bonus episode where we ask some very commonly asked questions in this community, plus a few fun ones as well, we did one back in September. I think it's like our fourth episode that we released or second. Like it is way, way, way early in the in the fantasy fangirls realm. Next episode will be on Monday, January 15th. Hey, that's Nicole's birthday, everybody. We will be covering chapters 45 through 51 of Iron Flame. Oh, that feels like so fitting that we're covering the throne scene on your birthday. I was literally about to say that. <laughs> Thank you, as always, to our executive producer, Hayden, a.k.a. our sanity manager. We truly don't know what we would do without you. And like we mentioned at the top of the episode, if you want more content, please join the Patreon party. We have the link in our show notes as well as the YouTube captions, and we will be so excited to see you over there. Like we also mentioned in today's episode, we are launching a newsletter later this month, so please be sure to sign up for it. Again, in the show notes, on social media, wherever you get your Fantasy Fangirls links. And of course, if you're not following us on Instagram and slash or TikTok, what are you doing? Give us a follow at Fantasy Fangirls Pod. And do not forget to please rate and review the show on whatever podcast platform you are listening on or like and subscribe if you are watching on YouTube. And last but not least, share with your fellow book-loving friends friends you know those friends who you've been trying to get into the fantasy fangirls for so damn long this is your gateway drug into getting into the fantasy fangirls hey here's your new best friends that's what you need to text them along with this link thank you so much for joining us today we'll talk to you soon bye, bye.
and it's dedicated to getting to oh my gosh oh dear oh we're off to the races today <laughs> okay i'm just gonna like do you want me to start over yes please okay oh, lexi and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> will take plate what am i saying very but, wow because it's <laughs> <laughs> being someone who's a piece of fuzz that keeps going in front of my camera <laughs> and is also an incredibly amazing manner.